So we made it into chapter 18 of the Gospel of Matthew. We're looking at verses 1 to 4. So let's read them. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would teach us now. And that as you teach us, that you would humble us, that you would change us, make us like children, Lord oh God. Open our ears and open our eyes so we can understand your word and enable us to respond to it, Lord. Amen. <coughs> okay, so this passage here, verse 1, it says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, it says at that time, and if you remember, this is the time period when Jesus has revealed quite clearly that he's the Messiah. And the disciples get this now. They're like, he is the Messiah. And Jesus has also revealed with that, that now he is going to have to go and suffer and die. And then he will rise again three days later. And his disciples, his brethren, who should now be like, Jesus, how much time have we got left with you right now? Do you need encouragement from us? Do you need help? If they were English, they'd say, do you want a cup of tea? <laughs> but they don't do any of these things. Instead, what they start thinking is, ah, the kingdom's round the corner. Yes, there must be some special places up for grabs. Hmm, how powerful will I be? And they're going on this tip. They're thinking about how great they will be. And so they're like, Jesus, who's going to be the greatest? Is it going to be Peter? And later you see that James and John are like, well, what about us? And their mum's like pushing them like, yeah, you boys, you go. And this is how they're thinking. And rather than us today say, oh, look at these disciples, we're so much better than them. Instead we should say, wow, isn't this an indictment against us? Aren't we the same? Don't humans have a desire to be great? And the biblical answer is yes, humans have a desire to be great. And God is great. And humans from day one, they come out of the womb and they say, I want to be great. Let me be great. And humans don't turn to God and focus on his greatness, on Jesus' greatness. Instead, they focus on their own greatness. And look how Jesus responds in verse 2. And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them. So you've got these disciples, maybe they're big blokes, yeah, they're all standing around, these big blokes, and they're like, who is the greatest? Who's it going to be? And Jesus gets a small boy, probably under the age of a teenager, right? and he puts him in the middle of them. Now what a surprise that would be. You're thinking, who is it? And suddenly, Jesus, using his visual eyes, puts a little child in the middle of them. It would have looked really small, and it would have been quite a shock to see that. And for a minute, it looks like he's going to say, this boy is the greatest. He's going to be the greatest. And you'd be thinking, what's going on? Because in their culture, children had no status. And different cultures view children different ways. Now, if you're from Rockhampton, yeah, then you know that children are not viewed good in any way at all in Rockhampton. If you're from other cultures, you might think children are esteemed very highly, especially if it's a boy, the mum's afraid to even tell him off. But for these guys here, in this story, these guys would view, they love children, but they view children as having no status. They had no status whatsoever. They had no power, no power whatsoever, and they had no privileges. All the children had was whatever their parents gave them. 
they were totally dependent on their parents. So when Jesus brings this little boy in front of them, he's not saying you don't have to be immature. He's not saying you don't have to be simple, not have much intelligence. What he's saying is you lot need to be totally dependent on someone else. You need to recognize you have no status. You have no privilege. Yeah, forget all that stuff. What about my rights? Have any of you ever been stopped by the police? Or you've seen other people? What about my rights? Try saying that to God. No privilege and no power. No power. So this would seem a bit of a shock to the disciples. Because here a little boy who is totally dependent on his dad for everything, for whatever his dad gives him, Jesus is now saying, hey, Here's an example of being great. And so what you can see here is that God does not think the same way that we do. Doesn't think the same way we do at all. For example, have you noticed how everyone is talking about self-esteem these days? I guarantee you, you can do any degree you want at university and you will be taught about self-esteem. Do sports science, you'll be taught about self-esteem. Do psychology, you'll definitely be taught about self-esteem. Do a youth work course, you will be taught about self-esteem. Whatever you do today, you will be taught about self-esteem because it's the new fact. And we think, as humans, that self-esteem is the answer. By the way, humans never used to think <coughs> it is a modern fact and it isn't proven. John MacArthur mentions the test they did where they had six different nations and they had students from those nations do a maths test and they tested their self-esteem as well and so they basically the Koreans did the best in this test and they asked the Koreans are you good at maths and they all said no they had low self-esteem when it came to maths but they did the best at maths now do you know who had the highest self-esteem? The Americans. The American students said, yes, I'm very good at maths. They got the lowest results out of all the six nations. It has not been proven that self-esteem in any way improves performance. Not at all. And I think we went in the time machine a few hundred years ago and told people, hey, it's all about self-esteem. They'd be like, what? what are you talking about? Well, we see here, even the disciples have an issue with self-esteem. Not that their self-esteem is too low, their self-esteem is too big. They've been rolling with Jesus for a while, and now they're like, well, maybe I'm up there, you know, maybe I'm going to be the greatest. And, you know, they are, they think they've got what it takes to be great. And it's the wrong attitude. They've got good we would call it good in our society, good self-esteem. They got a kind of self-esteem that if a kid came into a youth club and talked to a key worker and said, you know what, I want to be great, the youth worker on his child would be like, great, great self-esteem, yeah, this is good, we can work with this. But Jesus doesn't respond that way. It's like these disciples have just read Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, and they're saying, we want self-actualization. That's what it's all about. I want to be the greatest. And does Jesus turn around and say, good, I can work with that. You want to be the greatest. Does he say that? No. Look what he says, verse 3. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now this bit is really important because Jesus starts it with this phrase, truly I say to you. That means what I'm about to say is really important. In other words, disciples, don't nod off at this point. This is really important. And for everyone today in church, if you're about to daydream, don't daydream at this point, okay? Because Jesus says, truly I say to you, this next bit is really important. Jesus doesn't try to boost their self-esteem. Do you know that if he had, that would be the most unloving thing Jesus could have ever done. Jesus wants to glorify God. God wants to glorify God. And you might think, well, that's not 
very loving, God wanting to glorify himself. Shouldn't he want us to be glorified? No, because we're bad. And if God wanted us to think that we were great and to indulge ourselves in ourselves and making ourselves really happy and living our best life now, then God would be letting us live a horrible life. And instead, God says, listen guys, everything out there is bad except for me. If you look on my glory, you will be blessed and you will live your best life now. If you look to me and my glory. So Jesus doesn't want to boost anyone's self-esteem. He wants you to look to the Father and see him in his glory and see Jesus in his glory. So, he shows, he says to them first, they need to turn. He says, unless you turn, if they do not turn and become like children, they will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now let's look at this word turn. It's written in Greek originally, and it's the Greek word strepho. And in the standard dictionary for New Testament Greek, in Bowers Dictionary, it's written here as to experience an inward change, to turn, to change. So Bauer sees it as, when he says, unless you turn, it's like saying, unless you experience an inward change, <clears throat> you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And in Gingrich's and Freiburg's dictionary, it's translated as be converted. Unless you be converted, and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying that the disciples need to change. They need to get off this self-actualization, self-esteem trip. They need to change, but inwardly. How do you do that? How do you change yourself inwardly? I don't know if any of you guys have tried that. It's hard. I remember trying, and I was about 17 years old, trying desperately to change myself inwardly. It didn't work. Maybe some of you guys have had the same. Now, the point is, Jesus tells the disciples they need an inward change. They were thinking they were doing pretty good. They've been with Jesus a while. They've seen Jesus do all these miracles. They've done miracles themselves. They cast out demons. They've healed the sick. And they've given up everything to follow Jesus. And they're thinking they're pretty good at this stage. They have a very good CV. Very good CV. As far as missionaries go. Their self-esteem is good. They want to be the greatest. And Jesus says, you lot need to change. Now the application here is, if you have been trying to boost your self-esteem, and if you have been desiring to be great, you need to change. We all need to change inwardly. Inwardly, you can't go on Amazon now and buy a book on how to get out of the self-esteem trip. No, you can read it, but nothing's going to happen unless you have an inward change inside. Because as humans, we want to be great. Now, maybe that sounds good to you about a change. And maybe you're thinking, yeah, change is good. I've tried a few changes in the past. Did Atkins diet, that worked quite well. Did Pilates, that worked quite well. Did a bit of Tai Chi, that was good yoga. <coughs> yeah. Helped me out, Pilates, everything, you know. And you might think well, maybe it's like some new psychological thing to get into. But it's not, it's nothing like that because all of those are external things that humans do to try and make themselves change. And this is an inward change. Because Jesus says, truly I say to you, unless you turn, unless you experience this inward change, and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So the change he's talking about, the inward change, is one in which you become like little children. Now what does that mean to become like children? Remember that in this culture that we're looking at here, children had no status. So that's the first thing. Yeah? This change involves you recognizing you have no status. Now that's got to be hard. I'm looking around the room 
and I'm seeing a bunch of Westerners. So from day one, we grew up with Scriptures. That's hard to see in Scripture that as a human you have no status. Forget about the British Empire. <laughs> Remember as well that children had no power. Had no power. So that's the second thing here. That you as a human have no power. You have no power to improve your life. You have no power to conquer sin in your life. You have no power to live a good life. You have no power to please God. You have no power to do that. And the next thing is children have no privilege. You have no privileges. You have no right to go to God and say, God, sort me out. Make my life better. Have no right to do that whatsoever. No privilege as a human being. And this is what Jesus wants the disciples to get. Because they're coming in a totally different way. They think they have power. They think they know how to do things. Remember we saw a few verses back. They thought they could cast that demon out of the boy. They thought, yeah, we could do it. And they couldn't. Because they were trusting in their own power. And now they think they got privilege. They're thinking, yeah, we're going to be great in the kingdom. So they're doing all the wrong things here. They've got the wrong attitude. And the point is that God wants humans to sense their lack of status, their lack of power, their lack of privilege, and he wants them to depend on him. That is what God wants from humans. And this is really important because Jesus says, unless you turn to become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So as humans, unless we turn from our desire to big ourselves up, we will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The disciples were wondering what they would be in the future in the kingdom, and Jesus is saying, never mind what you'll be in the future, you're not even going to get into the kingdom of heaven if you have this kind of attitude. They've got the wrong attitude, just like so many people today, just like so many sermons today that are preached around the world have the wrong attitude. They're not gospel messages, they're moralism. And it used to be taught where a preacher would say, you've got to stop sinning, you've got to be good, you've got to obey the Ten Commandments, without talking about the cross. And people got tired of that after a while, and then the new guys came in with a smile on their face and said, don't worry. If you follow God's laws, God will give you a blessed life. Yeah, if you're generous, he will pay you later on. I'm almost quoting out of a newly published book that's the best seller in the States. And it's the same message as the old message, but done with a smile. And it's all moralism. It's all saying, if you be good and you have the power to do it, then God will reward you. And instead, Jesus says, no, you don't have the power to do it. You don't have the privilege. You don't have the status. You don't have the status to even come near to God. John the Baptist said he couldn't even untie or tie the sandal of Jesus. He wasn't even worthy to do that, to go near his feet. So who are we to think that we can wrap up a whole bunch of good deeds and then God will reward us? People can only enter God's kingdom if they come like a little child. Let me give you an illustration about a little child. Imagine a massive door that leads into the kingdom of heaven. Right? Big door, kingdom of heaven on the other side. And there's a door handle on the door that opens it, and it's 20 feet high in the air. 20 feet high in the air. A small child walks up to it, and he looks up at the handle, and he knows that he can't open that door. He knows he can't reach it. He knows that he is dependent on someone else to open it. So what does he do? I know I have two children. He says, Daddy, open please. That's what a child says when he wants to go through a door. That is how we are supposed to go to God. Saying, Daddy, I'm sorry, I'm bad. Forgive me. Please open the door for me. Now, imagine an adult going to the same door. An adult with high self-esteem. 
An adult who thinks they have status, privilege, and power. What does the adult do? The adult tries to reach it. <laughs> You've probably seen people do that. Blatantly, they can't reach whatever they're trying to get. He tries, then he tries jumping a bit, and he's like, I can do this. Then he tries to build a little ramp to try and get up. Then he tries running up the ramp and jumping the last bit. And the whole time he's like, I can get this door open. I'll do it. If I just try hard enough, I'll get the door open and I'll go into heaven. Now that is the heresy known as Pelagianism. That was declared a heresy in the 4th century, but yet is still prevalent today. Where people think, as humans, we have the power and we have the goodness and the status to get ourselves into heaven. And people keep trying to do it all the time. They're trying to <coughs> open this handle on their own instead of asking God to let them in. People do it by setting up religions and religious systems. People do it by turning up at church every Sunday. And they think, if I come every Sunday, then in the end, especially if I go to a midweek meeting, then in the end, God's got to let me in, hasn't he? If I help out with the chairs, God's going to let me in. People were... Uh, I'm sure that's not saying what's on my notes. So. Okay. But yeah, people do it all kinds of ways. People set up ways in which they try and make themselves right with God. Working for charities. It's not bad to work for a charity. But people do it and think, oh, I'll be good now if I do enough good. If I work in a community, I will get myself into heaven. If I obey God's law, I'll get myself into heaven. If I don't smoke, drink, drugs, or sex, then I will get into heaven. That's what a lot of people think. But if they don't come to God and say, Daddy, open please, if they don't do that, they will never, never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now this is the exact same phrase for never enter the kingdom of heaven as in Matthew 5.20 when Jesus said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That sounds pretty hard, doesn't it? Pharisees were pretty religious people. And he's saying your righteousness needs to exceed that. It needs to be more than them or you'll never enter heaven. Now there's two ways to approach this. One is to say, right, I'm going to try really hard to be good. I'm going to obey God's law. I'm going to try real hard. And that's the guy who's running and jumping and trying to catch that handle. And the other way is to say, Daddy, I can't do it. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Please open the door. Now this phrase is also very similar to John 3 verse 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Very similar phrase here, cannot enter the kingdom of God unless someone is born of water and the Spirit. Now we've looked at this verse in the past, and you know that this verse is not talking about baptism. This verse, as Nicodemus should have understood it, which Jesus rebukes him for it because he's a teacher of Israel and didn't get it, this is talking about what the Israelites were waiting for. In Ezekiel 36, 25, because the Israelites never were able to obey God's law, no matter what he did, God said about the future, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So here we've got God saying, Israelites, you can't do it. No matter what I do for you, I give you Moses, I give you judges, I give you kings, I give you prophets, you never follow my law. I give you land, milk and honey, you don't follow it. I exile you, you still don't follow it. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give you a whole new heart. I'm going to change you inwardly. I'm going to change the center of your being, 
and I'm going to cause you, notice he does it, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. You can't do it, but I will cause you to do it. And so when he says to Nicodemus in John 3 that you've got to be born of water and the Spirit, otherwise you can't enter the kingdom of heaven, he's saying, unless this happens to you, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus doesn't say, listen, you have to be really good, and then you can enter. He says, no, I have to make you good, and then you can enter. And this is what I believe Jesus is alluding to in Matthew 18.3, where he says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. I see this as we go to God and say, God, I can't live more righteous than the Pharisees. Forgive me. Let me in. God, I cannot obey your law. Forgive me. Let me in. I cannot make myself born again. Forgive me. Let me in. I cannot change my heart. Forgive me, let me in. I can't open the door, I can't reach the handle. Forgive me, God, let me in. The reason why we can't reach the handle is because we're born in sin. Because the human race is a sinful race that all comes from Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden. And when Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, in the grammar, it is not an imperative. In other words, it is not a command. Jesus doesn't say to Nicodemus, I command you, be born again. No, the grammar of it is him saying, it is necessary for you to be born again, otherwise you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. But you can't make yourself born again, Nicodemus. It don't matter that you're Jewish. You think you're cool because you're Jewish, but you need to be born again. And here with the disciples, we see a similar thing. They're Jewish and they were wrong with Jesus, so they're thinking they're good. They're the good guys. And Jesus is saying, no, you need to turn and become like children. You need to experience an inward change. So we have to go to God and say, I'm sorry, let me in, please. Save me. This is the right attitude to go with God. But check it out. Scripture says that as humans, none of us will ever want to do that in our present state. Look what scripture says, Romans 3, 11. No one understands, no one seeks for God. Scripture is clear that human beings born of Adam, the yeah, descendants from Adam in the Garden of Eden, human beings do not want to seek God. They do not even seek God. They look at the door, they look at the handle, and they don't understand. And they think, I can reach it. And every time they fall on the face, they think, I'll try harder. <laughs> they set up religions, they set up psychology, they set up self-help programs. They get calendars with a verse on it every day. They do yoga, they buy fair trade, they help in the community, they do a youth work course. All this because they don't understand that they can never <clears throat> open that door. Because they don't seek for God. They seek for anything except the true God that they have to turn to. They seek for false gods. They seek for religious experiences. But they will never want to seek for the true God. But all is not lost. Because if, it, if the story ended here, then no one would ever be saved. But God doesn't leave people this way. He gives repentance. Otherwise, no one else would get saved. Remember how originally in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, you've got Jews getting saved. Okay, at first it's just Jews getting saved, and the, the Jews are cool with this. They're repenting, they're turning to Jesus, and they're like, yeah, this is cool. And then Gentiles, non-Jews, start getting saved. And they're thinking, what's going on here? And look what they say in Acts 11, 18. This is Jews here. And they glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Okay, first thing to notice there is, it says God has granted repentance. God has given repentance. 
God has given repentance to the Gentiles also. So in other words, God gave repentance to us, and now he's given repentance to the Gentiles. They didn't say, we were really smart and we repented. They said, God gave us repentance as a gift, and now he's given it to the Gentiles. Praise God. So, the point here is that God gives repentance. Let me give you another example of this from the Old Testament. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 6. So, couriers went throughout all Israel and Judah with letters from the king and his princes, as the king had commanded, saying, O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. A bit later it says, For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, and will not turn away his face from you, if you turn to him. So he's saying to the people, the king is saying, Turn to God. If you turn to God, he will not turn away his face from you. That's great, and that is true. But look how humans respond, verse 10. So the couriers went from city to city, through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, and as far as Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mock them. That is how humans, born of Adam, respond to the idea of turning to God. They laugh them to scorn and mock them. No one understands, no one seeks God, as it says in Romans 3. Verse 11, however, some men of Asher, of Manasseh, and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Now you might think, aha, there's some good guys here. They humbled themselves. They could reach the handle. They entered the kingdom of heaven. But look at the next verse, verse 12. The hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. So the guys in Judah, they also turned to God. But why? Because the hand of the Lord is upon them. And the guys from Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun, the hand of the Lord was also on them. We've got this word also there. So the only reason why these guys turned to God, because he put his hand on them. He granted them repentance. It's true, they humbled themselves, and psychologically at that time, they were probably thinking, ah, oh, I've humbled myself. And that's often our experience. I got saved. And later we look back and we're like, no, God saved me. I was never going to turn to God. This is how we enter the kingdom of heaven. When God puts his hand on us and grants us repentance so that we can humble ourselves. Now let's go back to our verse in Matthew 18, verse 3. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now let me show you the way the New American Standard translates this. They say, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children. Now notice the difference there. ESV translates it as you turn. New American Standard translates it as you are converted. In other words, the New American Standard is translating the Greek word there in a passive sense. In other words, it's something that is done to you. Now, there's the